Hey, this is Matt Carbray with Ridgeline Financial Partners. This is Matt on Money. Thanks for joining in. Uh, the calendar year has turned over another year, and here we are in 2020. And the purpose of today's video blog is to talk about the SECURE Act, the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. Uh, they come up with these incredible acronyms for whatever reason. But with uh, that being said, this was a piece of legislation that got passed through with one of our budget extenders. As we have come to see over the last uh, 10 years, if not longer, we continue to have to come up with ways to fund the government. We have to continue to expand the debt limit. But aside from that being newsworthy was this SECURE Act. And what we're going to talk about today are the effects that it's going to have on you, potentially, uh, as a retirement saver, the effects that it's going to have on beneficiaries of retirement accounts moving forward after January 1st. And it's going to talk about some of the things that you can and cannot do with your retirement account, uh, some things that have stayed the same, some things that have changed. As with any piece of legislation, there's some good in it and there's some bad. So we'll get to all that as part of this discussion of the SECURE Act. Okay, first and foremost, for those of you that have a retirement account, whether that's an individual retirement account, a 401k from a former employer, for purposes of this example, we're going to assume that you are no longer working if, in fact, you do have a 401k from a former employer. You are required by law, or as of last year, to start taking distributions by the age of 70 and a half. Now, part of the SECURE Act, I think one of the most important aspects of the SECURE Act is that the required minimum distribution age is now being pushed out to 72, but that only benefits those of you that are not yet already taking required minimum distribution. So anyone who's already at the age in which they are forced to take a required minimum distribution by January 1st of 2020, unfortunately has to continue doing so. For those of you that would not have to take a required minimum distribution until 2020, well, you're gonna get the benefit of being able to push that back until you are age 72. So that's a nice little benefit. Your retirement money continues to grow. If you don't need it, you're not forced to have to take distributions. It's not to say that you can't take a distribution. Uh, if you reach the age of 59 and a half, you most certainly can. But one of the biggest provisions in the SECURE Act is the extension of the required minimum distribution age. Secondly, having to do more so with beneficiaries, uh, non-spousal beneficiaries. We won't talk about what happens when a spouse inherits a retirement account. Uh, it's Nothing has changed there. A spouse can take the IRA over as though it's his or her own and take distributions over either your life expectancy as the, re, um, the living spouse or based on the life expectancy of the decedent. Uh, so that's still the same. But what has changed, and for a lot of you out there who were hoping to pass this to the next generation and then have the next generation create additional wealth by taking it out steadily over the course of their life expectancy, there has been a change. Beneficiaries now that are non-spousal are going to have to exhaust the retirement account within 10 years after the date of death. So... What is that going to result in? Well, more tax, having to spend uh, and draw down the money much faster, and losing out on a lot of the compounding that otherwise would take effect. So those are two of the most important provisions relating to the SECURE Act that have to do with required minimum distributions and what happens when you become a beneficiary of an IRA or a 401k and you are a non-spousal beneficiary. Okay, so we tried to take the legislation and shrink it down. If we were to go over every single provision, we could be here for days. But our goal was to try and take what we think is relevant and put it in a, a video format for you so that you could listen to it and then determine what's more relevant to you. So if you remember back from the Tax, Jobs, and Cuts Act that was signed in late 2017 that became effective January 1st of 2018, there now is the ability for you to take your 529 college savings account assets and use them for K through 12 expenses subject to a $10,000 annual limitation. 
that's a positive uh, for sure for those of you that don't have money in other places to pay for expenses such as private school, Catholic school, um, or uh, anything that um, requires uh, an additional cost. Well, and another provision that was passed is the ability through the SECURE Act to take a lifetime, one-time $10,000 withdrawal and use that for purposes of paying off student loan indebtedness. Now, that is a really positive development. We find in our practice, more often than not, that parents, children are coming out of school with significant amounts of college debt. Now there's the ability to take out $10,000 and use that once a lifetime to pay down on that debt. So that's another positive provision. The last topic that we're going to discuss has to do with those of you that are taking required minimum distributions, but you are thinking about using a charity and giving a portion or the full amount of your required minimum distribution to a charity. So that law hasn't changed much. If you remember me saying the required minimum distribution age has been pushed back from 70 and a half to 72, uh, that is in fact the case, but your ability to take a deduction uh, or take a withdrawal and in turn move that money and pass it along to a qualified charity still exists at 70 and a half. So you don't have to wait to 72. If you give to the Boys and Girls Club every year, the Salvation Army, the American Red Cross, you can still at the age of 70 and a half take a portion or your full required minimum distribution up to $100,000 and give it to a qualified charity. You need to make sure it fits the definition of a qualified charity, and you need to make sure that you fill out the forms accordingly, but that's also an important provision of the SECURE Act that is not going to change your charitable intentions. Uh, last but not least, there uh, are other things that are built into the SECURE Act that have to do with retirement plans. What you are going to see, especially for those of you that are employed by smaller businesses, is that retirement plans are gonna get better and better in terms of fees, in terms of investment options, and also in terms of the legal and fiduciary obligations of those that sponsor those plans. So uh, retirement plans continue to get better and better for the end user. Uh, we expect that to continue. And we think that there's gonna be a lot of development in that particular space that's gonna get more of your retirement money going into the investments and most likely less going to fees and expenses. So that's uh, a quick breakdown of everything that the SECURE Act has to do with. There's a lot more that's out there, but we just felt that these are the provisions that are likely to have some sort of an effect on you. So we hope to catch you next month at Mad on Money. Please feel free to reach out to us on social media. Uh, you can reach us uh, by way of our website as well, which is www.ridgelinef, as in Frank, p as in paul.com. We hope you have a great start to the year, and we'll see you next month.